Psalm 139 To the Chief Musician, a Psalm of David The psalm would be entitled, God the Omnipresent Omnipresent means everywhere O Lord, Thou hast searched me and know me and God does exactly that he tries the heart he, for those who want to do right he, he tries to work out the, the infirmities that we have he tries to make us stronger and pure thou knowest my down sitting resting sitting and my uprising getting up so God knows when you when you're resting you're not doing and God knows when you are doing and when you're walking about <coughs> oh, sorry <coughs> oh, forgive me oh. so God knows when we're at ease and understands my thoughts afar off he knows your thoughts Wow, you know, it sounds like a song that I know. What we just read. It sounds like, you know, a song about a particular person and making a list and checking it twice. He knows where we've been bad or nice. This guy seems to know everything that God knows about me. I guess he's a God. I guess this guy can travel all around the world in one night like God can. Interesting. Thou, canst, uh, thou compass my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. There is not a word in my tongue but lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it all together. And in Matthew 12, it says, You'll give an account of every word that you speak. God is recording. God is the great know-it-all. He knows it all. And we're going to see that as we get deeper and deeper into this psalm. So when you call somebody a know-it-all, don't compare them to God. Thou has been, no, thou has beseech, which means surround me behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. So God's all around you. You think you're surrounded by troubles and problems? Well, God is there. And lay thy hand upon me. You know, that, that comfort. When somebody comes put their hand on your shoulder. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. You can't grasp it. It is high. You can't reach it. I cannot attain unto it. You know, we don't know even what heaven is like. Jesus told Nicodemus, listen, I can't, if you can't get earthly things, you're not going to get the heavenly. We have no idea. We just know it's going to be no pain, no sorrow, no tears. And what do you, how do you describe that? You can't. Whether shall I go from thy spirit? Oh, there's the Holy Spirit. And whether shall I flee from my presence the Holy Spirit is omnipresent the Trinity here we go if I ascend up to heaven if I ascend up into heaven they tried to do that in Genesis with the Tower of Babel they tried to do that down south there with the rocket ships. Thou art there. God's in heaven. 
There is. That's his home. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Jonah 2 9. Don't tell me Jonah didn't go to hell. Scripture was scripture. The omnipresence of God, Jesus Christ went to hell. Don't think that just because you go to hell that you know you're 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 absent from God knows you're there. He knows everyone that's there. Jesus told us exact words of the rich man that was in hell in Luke 16. How about that one? Told us exactly what he said, exactly what he felt, and exactly what he wanted. While he was on this earth, he knew what one man in hell was saying and doing. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the other most parts of the sea, Jonah 1 3. Jonah got in a boat and ran as far as he could. God knew exactly where he was. You can't run from your problems, you can't run from God. Even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. And Jonah thought he could get away from God, and he couldn't. Not only did he get in that boat and went the other direction, he went down, 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 and down to the side of the boat and fell asleep. And God knew exactly where he was. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. If I go extreme dark, I go somewhere where there's no light, I go down in a cave, and they're all over, all over that land over there, caves. There's a, there's a couple caves in America. They'll take you down in there, take you deep in there, and then they'll shut off the light for a few minutes. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee. Listen, just because you don't see the cockroach in your kitchen in the middle of the night, God does. What you're doing in darkness, God sees. But the night shineth as the day. Behold the eyes of the Lord in every place. Behold the evil and the good, Proverbs says. The darkness and the light are both alike to him. There is no darkness in God's eyes when he sees. You couldn't put a blindfold on God and then play hide and go see. It doesn't work with God. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Reins would be everything that, that makes you who you are, what you do, and how you do it, and why you do it. God the control thereof. Now we're going to get into talking about the womb, a child in the womb. How God created it and not Bing Bang. The wonders of birth. I will praise thee. And this is a famous verse. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 5. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. How can scientists say the, the human being wonderfully made, they don't have no fear so they don't understand, but you are put into fear of your body and your soul and your spirit of God that has to be educated out of you. That there is a God, that there is a consequences, there is a conscience, that that happened all by accident. And by accident, by teaching the, the, the fearfully is gone and the wonderfully is, is by accident. That's why you got all the crimes going on today. There is no conscience. But with God there is. My substance was not hid from thee. 
you know, it would be great when we get to heaven and find out that what man thought about conception and, and pregnancy was all, totally all wrong. I don't know. But God knows. When I was made in secret, I mean, it's not an open thing, conception. And curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Man came from dust. He's likened the womb as to a cave. Darkness. There is no light in the womb. For the first nine months of a, of a, of a, of a human fetus, there is no light. And God, as we saw that, you can't hide in darkness. And what what the Psalm of David, what he's saying here is, as I hide from darkness, as I was or any uh, fetus in a mother's womb in darkness, God, you are a servant. You, the fetus cannot hide from you. And that fetus is of you. And using that illustration to show what our lives are. Mother and dad may not know what that fetus is doing in the womb, but God does. You can't hide And courtesy wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thy eyes did see my substance. And today, with the use of, of cameras and, and technology, we can see the, the baby in the womb. But when, when this was written, you couldn't. But God could see. Yet being unperfect, born into sin, for all has sinned and come to short of glory of God. Uh, one of the writers, Job, writes that uh, as a man is born a woman is full of troubles. And in thy book all my members were written. So if a fetus is born into this world with every body part that's supposed to be there, it is written. I think we have 200 or 300 bones in our body. It's written down. If a fetus is born without a finger, without a lung, without a hand, half a heart, whatever, whatever the, the, the situations that can be birthed thereof, God records it. Now imagine appearing before God from the day you are born, God records everything that you were born with. Imagine one day preparing before God either judgment, the fact that, uh, that you are missing a liver because of drinking. Well, let's check the book. Wait a minute. You're missing a liver. Give an account for that liver. Where is the lungs? Where are the two healthy lungs I gave you that you gave over to smoking? Where are they? Give an account. Imagine a male or a female having to give an account for a sex change operation. How about that one? Did you know you'll have to give an account for your body? I had a bone taken out of my toe. If that bone was because of something I, I was not supposed to do that I did... I will have to give an account for that bone. You say, well, what of cancer? Did you have anything to do with that? If you had something removed from your body because of something, you, you had nothing to do with that. Of course God's not going to... Listen, you go off into a, into a military action and you, you get your arm blown away. That wasn't your fault. Like anything else that was removed from your body. 
But be rest assured that God knows what your body has. And if God has made you to be a male, God has built inside you to have a man instinct for a woman. And if God has made your your your, your uh, members to be counted for in his book as a female, you are to have the instincts of for a male, not vice versa. Which in continuance were fashioned, grown. Somehow David knew more than the doctors. David knew that one day a full-grown baby was not in the womb. He knew that. How did he know that? Because he walked with God. With all the children he had, you tell me that he didn't have a fellowship with God and say, God, what's going inside there? And God didn't sit down and talk with him about it? Don't think David and the men of the Old Testament were stupid. They had God as their teacher. Unlike today where they are stupid with their papers that hang on a the wall. They don't know nothing because they don't seek God. Rebecca is pregnant. And there is something going on in her belly. And she has no idea what it is. She goes to God, not the doctor, and says, God, what is going on with my belly? You're pregnant. And you got two babies in there and they are struggling without an ultrasound. Without an MRI. And God told her exactly what was going on inside her. You know what I believe? This is a psalm of David. I believe with each pregnancy that David sought the Lord and said, Hey Lord, what's going on in there? You see what happens when you seek God? You'll get the answers and you don't need to go to college. When as yet there was none of them. None of them what? There was no inside of a woman. How can I say this? There was no bot there was no baby. There was no arm. There was no brain. There was no heart. Human life begins as far as the womb. There's nothing there. The Bible will tell you that you know a baby is not there in the in a woman's womb for granted. It takes something. We know it takes a male seed and a and a, and a female egg. And who knows? That may have been the teaching one time, some around the nation, around day made that you know there's always been something there for a woman, and I don't know. But what David's telling us, a human life, as far as the womb, just begins with you need a man and a woman and God. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me. Now remember, David gets the sure mercies of, of God in the place of God. But who is David? He was a little shepherd boy. And God thought upon him, who am I? That the Bible says, as far as me, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Oh God, how great is the sum of them. Can you imagine God thinking about you? Now, if you're a worldly Christian, you get, get your mind off that. God ain't thinking about you, and Satan ain't going before uh, God to, to, to accuse you. You want to see a representation of that, what that is, you go read the life of Job. Job 1 and Job 2. I guarantee Paul was on the thoughts of God. Peter was on the thoughts of God. Men who obey God are on the thoughts of God. If I should count them, the thoughts, they are more in number than the sand. You know, we don't even know the most of David's life. And look at what's recorded about him. All the times that God thought about David by protecting him from Saul. 
How about that? How about just those? That David could have had a, an opportunity to kill Saul in battle, but God's thought was, you need to be somewhere else for two reasons. Not one, you ain't going to kill that king because you said you're not going to king, kill him because I annoyed him. And number two, you need to be out of that area so when he does die, no one will say you did it. So you get over to Ziglag. I'm going to send a bunch of people over there. They're going to take your family. They're not going to kill them. They're not going to rape them. They're just going to take your family so you have something to do somewhere else. That was on the thought of God. To protect David. And to keep him innocent. When I awake, I am still with thee. Well, look, at, look at David what he says. Not only David had surety. Every morning I wake up, you're going to be there, Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Boy, it was a Monday morning, and David, oh, Monday. No, David says, listen, you're in there, Lord. When I awake, I am still with thee. And that's David being with the Lord. The Lord with David and David with the Lord. What's the first thing you think about in the morning? Ooh, snooze. You get up. Surely thou will slay the wicked. Ooh, ooh, look at that. I see on the highways, thou shalt not kill. Misapplication of scripture, I guess. Surely thou will slay the wicked, O God. O God, God doing the, the slaying. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. The murderers, get away from me. It's funny, David was a bloody man. By war and by Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. For they speak against thee wickedly. You know, somebody that speaks against the Lord Jesus Christ, you are to tell them to depart from you. I don't care who they are. You are to count them as the enemy if they speak against Jesus Christ. Because the Bible just said they are wicked and God's going to slay them. There is a Bible teaching. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you love. I don't care what you what you have anything to do with what you have to do with. The Bible says that the people are speaking against your Lord God and Savior. Get away from them. And tell them to get away from you. And thine enemies take thy name in vain. I don't want to be around anybody who takes the Lord Jesus Christ's name in vain. I don't care who you are. When you start taking the Lord Jesus Christ's name in vain, I don't want to be around you. And I'm not going to be around you. And you can go too. I don't care. I love the Lord more. Do not I hate them, O Lord? I pray for their souls. But if I witness to them, there's nothing more I can do. Well, you keep saying, you know, you had one one wish and all that. You wish for the rapture. What about your unsaved family? I witnessed to them. They rejected God. I haven't. And for your rejection of God and you not being with the Lord that died and loved me, as much as you go to hell outside of my prayers for you, you don't want to have anything for Jesus, about Jesus, everything he's done for you, then listen, I, I say this reverently, I say go to hell. 
Because you have refused God's offering. You have refused the one that loved you. You have refused the one that died for you. You have refused the one that created you. You are the one that's in trouble. Now, if I witnessed to you and I prayed, to, prayed for you, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. I do. But I love them enough to go on the street and pass out gospel tracts and tell lost people about their sins and try to deal with them and try to get them out of the mess that they're in. Don't you tell me I hate people. I wouldn't be witnessing to them if I hated them. But if they hate God, I don't want their fellowship. I don't want to be around them. Now, that doesn't stop me from praying for them. That doesn't stop me from giving them tracts or preaching on the street or whatever or whoever it is. But I don't want you in my company. And you hate God if you don't tell if you don't do what God tells you to do. Because you are disobedient. You are rebelling against God. Well, how can a Christian be uh, who, who, who's backslidden? How can he be a bloody man? You're not telling them about Jesus Christ. And Jeremiah says, the, I mean, Ezekiel says, the blood of, of their lives will be on your fingertips. I wouldn't want that on my soul. People being cast off to hell. I'm all ready for the rapture. I'm ready to go. I'm saved. I know it. I have obeyed God. I am a sinner. I confess my sins. I put them on, under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I try to walk there with God. I have a right walk with him. I want to see Jesus. If you don't, that's your trouble. You've got a problem. You want to hang out with those that don't love the Lord? That is your problem, not mine. I'm going to go forward. You walk your walk, I'll walk the Lord's walk. I don't know how many people are my new family by doing what God's told me to do. The old family may have left me. But oh boy, look at the new family I got. And people I've never even met yet. Polish, Haitians. Sierra Leoneans, whatever they call them. Wherever fellowship, uh, the fellowship gospel tracks go out. To whoever I hear in gospel tracks. Listen, those people get saved. They are my family. And they turn away from the Lord. Of, what want to them? But I love the Lord. And I'm going to serve him. And we're not done. Do not I hate, O Lord, then they hate thee. And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee. The other day somebody used that four-letter word in Jesus going by. And that hurt my heart. That somebody would say that about Jesus. That those two words would be put together. That word in Jesus. That's not my Savior. If any word should not be applied to him, it would have been that word. I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them as my enemies. And the Bible says that you are to love your enemies, Jesus said. You are to pray for them. You are not to have fellowship with them. You are to witness to them. But you're not to sit at the same table. Family reunions are a disaster to the cause of Christianity. 
Because they're always on a Sunday afternoon where you don't go to church Sunday night. How dare you say grandma's in hell? Why? I got the Bible to say it. My church, I don't care what your church says. The Bible says. And yet all these people I have dealt with throughout my life, I am still praying for their souls until they die. But I don't want to have anything to do with you. You can't talk about Jesus. You can't talk about the Bible. Good. Uh, get out of my way. That goes for everyone. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Oh, people don't pray that prayer. Pray that prayer to God and see what God will do in your life. And that's a colon. You read on verse 24. Same sentence. And see if there be any in wicked way in me. Lord, what sins are in my life that are preventing our fellowship together to be sweet? Some people be afraid to pray that prayer because maybe they enjoy the sin that they're doing. And lead me in the way everlasting. The way everlasting is, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The way that the Lord Jesus Christ walked. That's the way. We went from the omnipresence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, to the miracleness that happens in the womb, to... If you don't love the Lord, you don't want anything to do with the Lord, go away. And when they go away, God knows exactly where they go. And when you go your way, hopefully, God knows where you're going. And then you're to end it by prayer for you to be pure before God, for God to show you what your sins are and where your imperfections are in your life and to get rid of them. God, put me over the melting part and, and boil me so that impurities will come up to the top. So you can, but That's a hard prayer. Yeah, but that kind of prayer and that kind of work God does in, in, in you will work a pure work that when you appear before the judgment seat of Christ, all the rewards you will get. It's a lesson from David. And you go back and look at David's life. David died talking to his son about doing what the will of God was. How's that? What will be, what will be your death words? I think David did pretty well. For God to, to tell us in his scriptures that Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That David had a contrite spirit and a broken heart. That's something. That's what God thought about David. We just read about that. What can God say about you? And remember, ver the omnipresence that we read, wherever you went. What can God say about you? The eyes of the Lord in every place, beholding the evil, which is first, because that's what we're prone to do, and the good. God's recording it all. 
God has acknowledged you from the womb. So far as for the womb, he writes down all your body parts. So at the moment you're conceived, God begins a book. And he's making a list and checking it twice to see who's been naughty or nice. Because Jesus is coming soon. Forget about the other fat guy. Your conduct will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ whether you get or lose reward. That's up to you. My ministry is to, is to tell the lost about Jesus and those that are saved to get you on the right path so you'll be pleased with the Lord and walking with the Lord rightly. So you will get a reward. And if you don't like my conduct, you don't like what I say, you don't like what I have to say, it's out of the Bible and I don't care. I just read the words to you. And if I touch the thorn or anything like that, that's the word of God. I've been doing this since Genesis chapter 1. I have not changed. Because the Bible has not changed. I'm not going to change because God said he changes not. This is what God expects from us. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. And when I think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration.